Oh, hey. Welcome to James Fortin's Sail Loft. Here in Black Founders, the Fortin family of Philadelphia, we've recreated just a small portion of Fortin's workroom, a giant open room where dozens of sail makers would have worked hand sewing every inch of those large sails that push ships around the world. But how did James Fortin become a man of business? How do you end up being the master of a shop like this, employing an integrated workforce of free black and white men? Before his service in the Revolutionary War, James Fortin's father had been a sailmaker. So we can imagine a young James Fortin running around a shop like this, helping with small chores, picking up scraps of canvas off the floor. After he served on a privateer and returned to Philadelphia, Fortin entered the employment of a man named Robert Bridges. Bridges was a master sailmaker. He had made goods for the Revolutionary Army. And Fortin advanced up a ladder of craft apprenticeship, learning different skills, eventually becoming a journeyman. Robert Bridges wanted his own sons to go into other trades, to become merchants, perhaps, or lawyers. So he gave James Fortin the business. It really mattered that James Fortin became a sailmaker and not a blacksmith or a printer. The nature of sailmaking, the people he met, even the materials in his loft changed the rest of his life. He corresponded with people from all over the world, but he also grappled with what the sails were made from. James Horton was someone who was dedicated to buying the products of free labor grocery stores, places that only sold products not made with enslaved labor. He was an abolitionist. But at the height of his career, sailmakers stopped using linen and hemp, mostly imported, and they started using strong, durable, patriotic, American-grown cotton. But James Horton knew that every inch of that American cotton had been grown by enslaved labor in the South. We can only imagine how much this must have bothered him. Part of that is because we don't have many records from his business. Here in Black Founders, we have a few amazing examples of receipts and banknotes, just the tip of the iceberg of an enormous amount of paperwork that would have been created thanks to this loft. He died in 1842 and his sons inherited the business. They were immediately beset by financial troubles, and that's probably why most of the records of his business were lost or destroyed. But they sold the business to employees of the shop and it remained a black-owned business in 19th century Philadelphia. You can imagine what that shop was like, the dozens of people who worked in it, the fabric they used, and what it meant to James Fortin's world by exploring the sail off right here in Black Founders.